of this illness. I want to thank you so much for coming, and a special thank you to Representatives Tom Davis and Nita Lowy for hosting this event. In addition, we want to recognize the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, for the recent inclusion of borderline personality disorder in their portfolio as one of their five priority populations. A special thanks to Andrew Sperling and Lynn Borden for their energy and assistance. Borderline personality disorder, or BPD, is a devastating psychiatric disorder. About one in 50 people have the disorder. It's more common than schizophrenia, and I would wager that most all of you in this room know someone affected by this illness. BPD is a disorder involving an extreme emotional sensitivity that leaves a person vulnerable to intense pain in daily life. One consequence of the disorder is its role as a leading cause of suicide with a 10% suicide rate. Tragically, the youth are affected in great numbers. A full 33% of adolescents who commit suicide are thought to have BPD. However, unfortunately, the importance of early detection has been challenged because people do not want to label an adolescent with such a devastating illness. This, you will hear from Stacy, deters recovery. Similar to autism and schizophrenia, early intervention is crucial. BPD also has the dubious distinction of being considered the leprosy of mental illnesses. It has only been officially recognized by the psychiatric profession since 1980 and thus lags several decades behind other psychiatric disorders in understanding and research. Of particular note, several of its symptoms, namely suicide attempts and bodily self-harm, are two of the most threatening manifestations of all mental illnesses. Also, despite its prevalence, severity, and the suffering it causes, the disorder is sorely underdiagnosed. One main reason is a lack of information and awareness about the disorder, which contributes to a level of stigma that goes beyond the general shame surrounding all mental illnesses. However, more recently, thanks to the research funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, we are beginning to understand better the nature of BPD and develop treatments that are truly useful. The road for BPD has not been easy. Take, for example, the name. What does borderline mean? There's nothing borderline about the illness, nothing borderline about its suffering, its inaccessibility to care, nothing borderline about the gaps in our knowledge. Finally, there is nothing borderline about the impact of the illness on others. And so this brings me to families. I want to underscore the pain of family members who until recently have been seen as the villains. Now, thanks again to research funded by NIMH, we know that the development of BPD is multifaceted. Individuals have certain inherent biological predispositions to the illness, for example, the exquisite emotional vulnerability. Environmental factors, whether they originate at home, school, or from peers, accentuate those innate vulnerabilities. That being said, families cannot travel this journey alone. As a rabbi friend of mine said, you are as happy as your least happy child. With that sentiment in mind, imagine what it must be like to get a call in the middle of the night from your daughter saying that she has just swallowed a bottle of pills or that she is cutting herself with a razor blade. Yet these calls are part of family life when a member has borderline personality disorder. Also of great note is the financial cost. Persons with BPD make up about 40% of the high users of the mental health services. We appreciate this educational opportunity to build awareness of borderline personality disorder in Congress. As your constituents, we hope we can partner with you to decrease the suffering caused by this serious mental illness. The tide is beginning to turn, but we need your help. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ellen Stover, who will moderate the presentations. Dr. Stover is a division director at NIMH. She has been closely involved with the efforts at the Institute to increase the research concerning borderline personality disorder. We thank you, Dr. Stover, and your colleagues over the years for all your work on this behalf and for participating with us here today. Thank you. 
Thank, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Perry. I'm delighted to be here today to moderate this session. Uh, in addition to running one division since September, after the brutal murder of Dr. Wayne Fenton by his patient, I've also been running his division. That division houses borderline personality disorder research. We also fund a lot of work on stigma and adherence to medication, and I think you'll hear a lot about that today. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, uh, Tammy, who will speak to you about her own personal experience. Good afternoon. My name is Tammy and I have borderline personality disorder. Some 20 years ago, I walked these very halls lobbying and educating Congress myself. I went on to raise a family and have had a very successful life as a corporate salesperson and business consultant. My IQ is in the 130s range. I am well educated and well spoken and have been very effective in many areas of life. It would be hard to notice that I am severely impaired in some key areas of brain functioning. Ironically, while my brain allows me to remain comfortable presenting to members of Congress, the part of my brain that controls my emotions and the part that helps with impulse control do not work. Imagine if your brain replayed over and over and over again the most horrifying tragedies of your life, the saddest moments, the loneliest times, and they became your reality each and every day. That has been my life. <laughs> Tormented, I went to over a dozen therapists trying to find an answer to my difficulties. I read every self-help book, tried every new technique, and went to support groups. Eventually, I lost my job, my health, and saddest of all, I lost my children. I was so impaired, I could not get out of bed, and I could not provide for myself. Some of us end up in prison because some of us are incapable of controlling our impulsivity. The anguish became so severe for me that I attempted suicide several times in order to find relief. Many others of us cut themselves or abuse alcohol or drugs just to find relief. Some of us have eating disorders. This illness almost took my life, and I can't even bear to calculate the damage it has done to my family. Just because no one knew, not even the therapists I went to, not the attendants who pumped the pills out of my stomach, not the psychiatrist who gave me the all clear sign and sent me home. Many days are still a great struggle for me. My intense emotions still take over my cognitive ability and I often hurt my husband with inappropriate comments. I can sit before you fully aware of this fact right now, but I'm unable to stop myself during the moment. To my great fortune, I finally found a therapist who accurately diagnosed me last fall. There is a very effective treatment available for my disorder and I am finally getting better. I am gaining control of my own mind and painful thoughts are losing their grip on my imagination. My future looks very bright. My hero, my husband, remains by my side and my relationships with my children, my family and friends are improving. I am working again. So why am I here? Would you hire me knowing what I have just told you about myself? Why would I allow myself to be branded as one who has a mental illness, a brand that potentially could exclude me from the status I have enjoyed in my career and my community? I am here because you don't know about this illness. And you might know someone who is suffering beyond your comprehension and no one can figure out why. 
Or you might see yourself in my own story but have been reluctant to get help because of the stigma attached. This is very personal to me. I would not be here alive if I had not been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and received the treatment I have been undergoing. Having myself suffered unimaginably because of ignorance, I want to do my part to educate others so that they won't have to suffer anymore. I'm asking you to commit to educate yourselves and other members of Congress about this illness. We have got to spread the word and help others to know that there is a reason for their suffering and that there is a treatment that works and it is not their fault. This illness is highly treatable and those of us who have it can have a life worth living. I'm putting myself before you as a resource. I have my business cards on the back table. Call me if you have any questions. Please don't forget us when you're drafting or supporting legislation that can make a difference, that can actually heal us. I sincerely appreciate your time today and I wish you all the best. Take care. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, if anyone has a question, we can take a couple before the next speaker. We'll plan to take questions after each speaker. Are there any? Yes. Doctor to doctor. It was just luck. Um, I think if someone suspects that, um, you know, someone has symptoms, they can go to different resources that we're making ourselves available. But I just happened to go to a therapist that knew of it, and he took a long time in telling me about it and was careful about it. But I'm very grateful for it. I was actually going for couples couples therapy. Time. Um, Tammy, is there a net is there a network of uh, therapists that are well briefed on this particular disorder? Um, I'm not sure about that. Can you answer that, Perry? There are a few ways that you can find out more about therapists. One is there's a resource center. It's called the Borderline Personality Disorder Resource Center, and it's in Westchester. Their number is 914-682-5496. There are also d several different treatments. Uh, one of the treatments is called Dialectical Behavior Therapy. You can go on their website, which is called behavioraltech.com. There are also other treatments that are um, out there as well. And if you want to email us or go on our website, which is t very easy to remember, it's www.borderlinepersonalitydisorder.com. We can also lead you to therapists across the country. Do you have a question? Question is for Tammy. Looking back on it, can looking back on it, can you tell now what what may have been the first signs that you know as a parent that should be looking for? I think borderline personality disorder manifests itself differently in in different people. Um, certainly, I was a very sensitive child. I would cry to music and things like that. I'd get my feelings very hurt. Um, some of us act out, um, but really looking back, I can think of ways where the only way I can describe it is I would go into my mind and kind of retreat into my mind um, at different times, even as a child. My symptoms did not get severe. Um, I had some uh, drug use in high school and some depression, but my symptoms really didn't get severe until some major significant life stressors happened to me. So you can, it's my understanding that you can carry traits of this or have parts of this and it can come out at any time in life. So, you know, if you suspect someone that you love might have it, it's just really good to get treatment as early as possible. Any other questions? Thank you all. Appreciate you coming. Right here. Oh, sorry. That's fine. I was just wondering, were you misdiagnosed with anything when you when your symptoms started getting bad, like depression or any of those other type of disorders? Yeah, um, Dr. Friedel is going to talk a little bit about co-occurring disorders. It's very, very common if you have borderline personality disorder to have another um, disorder, and so it's very common to get diagnosed with a different thing, but you don't get to kind of what I see was the heart of my matter which was borderline personality disorder. 
I was diagnosed with, as having depression at different times in life, but that was it. Thank you. We'll have time at the end also for questions. I wanted to, before I introduce our next speaker, acknowledge three people that came with me from the National Institute of Mental Health, Gemma Weiblinger in the director's office, Michael Kozak in the division that supports borderline personality, and is Jim in the room? Jim Breeling, <laughs> who, who on a day, daily basis uh, uh, supports the program. So the next speaker is Stacy, who's the mother of a daughter with borderline personality. Good afternoon. Some years back, I watched a friend's mother die of Lou Gehrig's disease. The image of that smart, vibrant woman losing the ability to interact with the world and becoming a fully aware prisoner of her own body affected me profoundly. I thought there could be no worse disease. I was wrong. My younger daughter suffers from a disease wherein her body functions normally, but her emotions hold her prisoner and prevent her from having normal, easy interactions with the world around her. For years, no one around her understood the emotional storm raging within her that she struggled to live through and in spite of every day. We did not recognize her struggle for the heroic effort it was. Instead, we often judged her as self-absorbed, lacking in self-control and self-discipline, and above all, over-emotional. In terms of our ignorance, we were pretty typical. While our BPD family story is unique to us in the detail, it is universal in its outline. We have two daughters. The younger was from the start very social and outgoing. Charming, yes, but she was not an easy child. As a little kid, her reactions to everything, to the slightest mishap, were over the top, off the scales. We almost had a mantra calm down, you're overreacting. We chalked it up to her being high-spirited, but as she grew, her emotions were more and more out of proportion to the context of the moment. In fifth grade, she enrolled herself in anger management class offered by a school counselor. They told us she was the first student ever in the history of the elementary school who had self-referred. Everyone smiled thinking that this very social child simply wanted to join yet another group. In retrospect now, we realized she was really looking for help. And the tragedy is that even if we had known then what was going on within her, there was no help and no support available. In middle school, things began to fall apart. Her over-the-top reactions to any upset alienated her friends. At 12, she was beyond high maintenance. The same heightened sensitivity wreaked havoc with her schoolwork. Testing followed, which identified an exceptionally high IQ and an ADD profile. In seventh grade, as her peer relationships fell apart, she began working with one of the best adolescent therapists in the country. He diagnosed depression compounded by ADD, and the process of trying out various combinations of medications began. Our daughter's behaviors at home were more intense and erratic than they were at school. Sometimes she would react to anything we said as if we were viciously attacking her. Other times she was extremely clingy and needy. By default, we were our daughter's best companions. What she wanted, of course, was to have friends and be spending time with them. She would often talk to us about it. Why did no one want to spend time with her? How could she be the kind of person that people would like? It was heartbreaking and perplexing for us to witness her isolation and despair, but we figured that eventually the stage of her life would pass. We were always hopeful, a new therapist, a new medication, and ultimately a new high school, the boarding school where I worked and where she had grown up. The adults there had helped to raise her. They knew her and her issues well. They looked forward to working with her. As our daughter started there, we told her she could just be herself and folks would help her find her way. Six weeks later, with no warning, my colleagues insisted we pull her out of school. She had not broken any rules, but the intensity of her emotions once again alarmed other kids. I recount all this as an example of how people, even kind and well-informed educators, often react with fear and punishment to typical BPD behaviors. This lack of understanding compounds the tragedy of this illness. And so the child who most feared being shunned by her peers was now officially a pariah. Amazingly, though, she did not become hopeless. We arranged for more testing, this time with psychiatric testing included. After days of tests, the results were learning disability not otherwise specified. Frustrated by an ill-defined diagnosis, diagnosis which gave us no clear course of action, 
We took our daughter for more testing with a neuropsychologist. He was very clear in his assessment. She has no learning disability. She has high levels of anxiety, and that is what is interfering with her processing. Her profiles are classic for an adult with borderline personality disorder. Does she have BPD, we asked? No, he said, because I cannot diagnose it in anyone younger than 18, but she does seem to have BPD traits. And so we went home and read about BPD. Everything about it sounded frightening. Dysfunctional relationships, high rate of suicide, and worst of all, there were no treatments and no medications for it. We had a hopeful, still willing to try to get better child and a hopeless illness. We decided that we would act on the learning disability diagnosis as at least there were treatments, and our daughter went to an LD school. But she did not have an LD. She had borderline personality disorder. Over seven months, her emotions began to overwhelm her. She felt deep despair, even though she had friends and things were going well. She went downhill with breathtaking speed. Even so, her suicide attempt shocked us all, therapist included. The child who always rallied and was always hopeful was hollow. She wanted to die. And we could not reach her. We were desperate to find help. I read about a treatment for VPD called dialectical behavior therapy, but could locate no practitioners. Finding no treatment near us, we began looking nationwide for treatment options. We were between a rock and a hard place. All of the literature on BPD tells you to keep your, your BPD family members close to their families. And here we were considering sending our daughter away. We found a residential treatment program in Utah. They were willing to try working with a teen with BPD. Fortunately, it proved to be just what our daughter needed. They gave her tools and skills with which to regulate her emotions. And over time, the anguish inside her began to lessen. We found an organization through, called Family Connections through the National Education Alliance for BPD, and that helped us to regain and retain our own equilibrium. With support, our daughter's life, our lives, and our life as a family became calmer and happier. We are hopeful that our daughter will have a rich and purposeful adult life. Thank you. Again, we have time for a few questions for Stacy. Yes, in the back. How is a diagnosis, um, you know, I guess bipolar, the high highs and the very low lows, different from this borderline um, personality disorder? The difference is the frequency, how quickly they occur. In bipolar disorder, the cycles, even the rapid cycling, people with bipolar disorder, the cycles occur over weeks and sometimes months. We're talking about cycles of emotions that will occur sometimes hourly, if even not more frequently, come and go that quickly, which is distinctly different from bipolar disorder. Does that help? That's, that's only one. That's the, the quick answer. Are there any other questions before we move on? Yes. Um, yes. yes. Um, in um, your remarks, you mentioned that it can only be um, diagnosed in uh, people over the age of 18, but there's warning signs when they're children. So I'm wondering, I mean, that seems a little confusing. I'm wondering if maybe you can explain that or someone could explain that a little bit more about what a parent should look oh, for. Oh. Can Dr. Friedel can't hear the question. I'm sorry. The, the question was that um, in her remarks she mentioned that it could only be diagnosed after the age of 18. Yes. Yeah, it appears there's significant symptoms during childhood. So I'm wondering if maybe you could ad address that. Yes, very briefly the answer is that's completely untrue. Um, you can make the diagnosis, especially starting at about puberty. Before then it's difficult to, with great precision, uh, and validity make the diagnosis because even similar symptoms can then branch out during adolescence. But by the time a youngster reaches, um, again, puberty, um, it's been shown by a number of research projects that you can make the, uh, the diagnosis quite validly. So anyone who says you can't do that before, it's, um, unfortunately, does not know the literature well and unfortunately misleads people so they don't get good care in t as early as they should.
Yes. Sort of treatments are very, very limited. There, there are practices for dialectical behavior therapy now that are starting to take adolescents in and run special groups for adolescents, but again, it is, it is lagging the slowest of all of the, the interventions. So. Thank you very much. Are the slides ready? I'll go ahead with the next speaker if there are no other questions. No? Okay. Um, our final speaker before we open it up for discussion is Dr. Robert Friedel, Friedel, who's a distinguished psychiatric researcher, and particularly in the area of borderline personality disorder. He also has treated or taken care of people with borderline personality disorder for more than 40 years, and actually spent two years at the National Institute of Mental Health early in his career. He's an author, and his book, Borderline Personality Disorder Demystifies, has sold more than 40,000 40? 40, copies. So we, we welcome him and look forward to hearing his comments about this terrible disorder. Dr. Friedel. Very crowded back here. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you for coming today. I know you have a very crowded schedule. I approach worldwide disorder from two perspectives. One is the academic and clinical, which you just heard, but also I take it very personally. My sister, a year and a half younger than I, suffered from borderline disorder. We grew up knowing the symptoms of the disorder, but not knowing what she suffered from. Um, she died tragically at a, the age of about 42 or 43 from a complication of borderline disorder. Uh, she was also in, uh, using alcohol and other substances heavily and eventually that caused her demise. Uh, unfortunately, the genes that predispose people to borderline disorder seem to run rather strongly in the family as well because now in two succeeding generations after my sister and the extended family we have one girl who in each of those generations who also suffers. Therefore, it's very, very important to me to try to be of help. Let's um, begin by looking very carefully at the symptoms of borderline disorder because, as you've heard, oftentimes this uh, disorder is misdiagnosed. The symptoms can be grouped um, into four areas. The first is emotional instability. What we see is rapid fluctuations of mood, very rapid uh, indeed, um, including all moods, not just the negative ones of sadness, anger, uh, and anxiety, but also um, happy moods as well. Um, but the instability of moods is what is so impressive about this disorder. There's also the hyperactivity of the moods. It's this much causing a mood change in anyone, this is how much the mood is going to change, but in people with borderline disorder, that's the mood response, the emotional response. And it takes a longer time for the mood to return back to normal again. So effective um, Instability is a key, key symptom category. The second is impulsivity. For reasons that we're beginning to understand, the amount of impulse control that people with borderline disorder are able to demonstrate is not that which it um, should be. Those brain systems are not working as well as they need to, and therefore they engage in often in harmful behaviors um, such as excessive um, alcohol abuse, um, excessive um, uh, and inappropriate sexual activity, um, driving too fast, excessive spending, sometimes to the point where they, in an attempt to bring down the high levels of emotional pain that they suffer, will hurt themselves, physically hurt themselves. That is, cutting is the most common, burning, and so on. It is, that is not an intent to kill. But unfortunately, some with severe depressions also have high levels of suicidality. Altered thinking. Um, the third category is demonstrated by persistent levels of suspiciousness, um, sometimes even frank paranoia under great stress. 
Um, in addition to that, there is this phenomenon of all or nothing thinking, where people are good or bad, situations are black and white. Finding the gray zone in life is very difficult for people with borderline disorder, but that's where we spend 90% of our time in this world is in that gray zone. It's very hard for them to integrate, to synthesize the, the conflicting, if you will, the dialectical, from whence comes the term dialectical behavior therapy, the, di the dialectical tensions that they feel, feel and think about a lot of things. And then finally, if the first three things are not working well for you, is there any doubt in your mind that there will be some um, tumultuousness in your relationships? Not hardly. So the, but the characteristics of this tumult um, uh, are such that patients with the disorder, as you've heard earlier from, um, uh, from Stacy, that her daughter was very concerned about abandonment. Uh, at the same time, however, there's the, uh, the difficulty in getting close and being close to people, establishing close relationships with them. So from that stems again the dialectical tension that comes into, I hate you, don't leave me. It, uh, it seems on the face of it to be absurd, but it's not absurd to the people who feel it. It's quite real to them. Um, Perry, oh, you've got it, Jim. Thank you. It's staggering the increase in prevalence of other disorders, other common psychiatric disorders that occur in people with borderline disorder. As you quickly um, look over this slide, you'll see that in almost every instance, there's more than a tenfold increase in the prevalence of major disorders along with borderline disorder. So it's not unusual for people with borderline disorder to have two to three and sometimes four different separate diagnosable psychiatric disorders. Now that makes, number one, it makes it very, very difficult for physicians and other clinicians to diagnose the disorder. So that's why a lot of patients will come in and be diagnosed with borderline disorder, depression, ADHD, and carry all these diagnoses and nobody really get it, which is the core problem that's driving, the engine that's driving these other disorders to some significant degree is the borderline disorder. Until it's diagnosed, the chances of the others doing well is really quite slim. It takes an also an enormous amount of clinical skill to parse out these disorders and to treat each of them effectively and in the proper sequence because if you get them out of sequence, you can often do more harm than good, and that's, of course, not good. We've discussed the age of onset. Um, as I've indicated, it's um, not uncommon for children to dis demonstrate some difficulties, so we've already heard that um, this afternoon. Um, it, is, it is difficult, though, to precisely make the diagnosis most of the time, the diagnosis is made in the teens and in the 20s. Unfortunately, these are the most formative years for people. And to have them have their lives disrupted in the ways that we've heard that they're disrupted um, has, leaves permanent, permanent scars on, on many people with a disorder. Very disheartening to them, to their families, and to those who attempt to give, um, provide care for them. The severity of symptoms because there are different causes of the disorder that blend together. The severity range from mild to severe, of course, not surprising. The same is true of diabetes. Same is true of any health uh, med medical disorder. You get all spectrums of severity, complexes of symptoms. So we should expect that, of course, in borderline disorder as well, and that's what we see. Fortunately, a number of people with borderline disorder, even with the most severe types of the disorder, experience over time a reduction in their symptoms. That doesn't mean that they go into either full remission necessarily, or even if they go into, quote, full remission, that is, they don't have five of eight key or nine key critical symptoms, that they don't suffer anymore. Of course they do. It's just that the suffering in certain areas is less. But if the symptoms still disrupt their lives significantly, still require sustained treatment and care, which is a diabetic who is under good control still requires the insulin, still requires all of the other behavioral, if you will, interventions that are necessary for them to lead reasonable lives. The prognosis is good, but it or bad, it depends on a certain situation. That's why it's one of them is that 
the how early detection occurs. Not surprisingly, the earlier that one can uh, intervene with the appropriate treatments, the better the outcome. Um, so effective treatment early on are the two best prognostic indicators that we know in borderline disorder. There are some not so good prognostic uh, indicators. Um, they are listed here as well and they include impulsivity. Fortunately, impulsivity decreases with aging. As someone who's beginning to enter that period of life, it's nice to know there are a few things that get a little bit better as you get older. That's one of them, thank God. In addition to that, substance abuse, uh, negative predictor. Um, it's very, very hard to treat effectively people with substance abuse. My ap approach is always let's let's tackle the substance abuse first, then we'll go after the other after the other problems promptly. Early sustained abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sustained abuse, not good predictors. And then a spectrum of ineffective parenting. Remember, I said ineffective, not poor. Ineffective. Um, means not bad parenting, not bad parents. It's just that the parents don't know how to deal with the problem properly. But parents of diabetic children first don't know how to do that well either. Very, uh, Jim, may I have the next slide, please? Um, I'm going to tell you in, in four minutes or probably less than that how the brain works this morning, uh, this afternoon. Some, some cynics say that uh, if the brain were easy enough to understand it, you couldn't. Uh, that's not so. We really have come a long way in understanding the brain, and it is, uh, I think, um, it's reached the point where we can describe, so, uh, relate the symptoms that we've just discussed to certain brain pathways and even to their physiology and chemistry. And so let's try to do that and pull together, if you will, the symptom groups that we've discussed and try to put that in the context, try to base them in the, in the way the brain works. To do that, you have to understand certain things. First of all, the brain's functions work specifically on, on specific anatomical pathways. The regions in the brain that control motor behavior always move from a certain point in the cortex down certain pathways, very specific. Same for vision, same for smell, same for emotional regulation, for thinking, for impulse control, very specific pathways. They don't all have to be disordered. You just have to have a disorder in one or two or three, and you've got a problem. Only a couple of transmitters, five billion, um, uh, five hundreds of billions of cells work on only two neurotransmitters. The ones you hear the most of, however, are the least, um, the cells with the least number. Dopamine, which you've heard a lot of because of its importance in Parkinson's disorder, there are only 75,000 dopamine cells in the entire brain. The entire brain. What they're meant to do, however, is modulate those other pathways to move them up, move them down, much like the gain on a radio or any kind of electrical equipment, so to speak. So they're modulators. But without them, the major circuits, although they may be fine, don't work well. The activity in those circuits, um, or the, finally, the conscious recognition of activity, really relates to how much of that circuitry hits the cortex. Very little does, we're not so conscious of what's going on. And it's meant to be that way, not to worry about it. We don't need to be thinking about everything our brain is doing. We don't want to know everything our brain is doing. It's got to do its work. Can I have the next slide, please? Three emotional, uh, three. Um, Neural systems relate to the three um, behavioral systems we see with borderline disorder. I'm going to focus on the first one because of time, and that's the amygdala system. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, but before we get to that one, I want to point out that on the cortex, the other two systems, the DLPC, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the representation there is very important in our ability to think, to reason, to perform executive functions, make sets, that type of thing. Very, and that, that is disturbed, and um, there's evidence for that in people with borderline disorder. Um, the uh, limbic system, especially the top one, the, uh, the um, anterior um, cingulate area, activity in that area has a great effect on, on tempering the emotional impulses that come up from the bottom 
from the limbic system, if you will, the core places in the, in the lower brain that produce emotions quickly and that have to be handled, they're handled from the top down by thinking and by also impulse control. Those two systems are faulty, but so is the emotion control system. We can have the next slide. The amygdala system has certain functions. The amygdala system determines emotional significance of things, very important. It provides information to other neural systems that reinforce critical memories. What do we remember? We remember those things that are emotionally important to us, right? If they are not emotionally important, why should we waste brain space? And we don't. So we use that system, the amygdala system, to say yeah, this is how much emotional balance it has and we go from there. And the final two, not so critical to what we're doing right now. If we can go on to the next slide, please, Jim. Here's the limbic system. On, in the middle, that's a, a sagittal cut of the brain right through this way, right through the middle. You can see it's on the internal part. And you can see that, that down at the bottom, in this area, is a little almond-shaped, cleverly named uh, organ, cleverly named the amygdala, derivative from almond. And it's about the size of an almond. That little rascal has feeds an enormous circuitry of cells that help regulate, produce and regulate emotions. Very important. Why is that important to borderline disorder? We can have the next slide, please. Because in people with borderline disorder, two phenomenal things happen when we do brain images of them. One is that the amygdala system is hypertrophied. It's smaller in size. In spite of the fact that it's smaller in size, people with borderline disorder, and this is the amygdala area here in people who have um, norm, who are normals, controls, versus those with borderline patients. And see the amount of activity going on here? This is even when they're presented with normal faces, happy faces, sad and fearful faces. It doesn't make any difference. That amygdala system is really humming. It's not working the way it should be working. It's vibrating. That's clearly bad news. And then one wonders why people with borderline disorder have hyperemotionality. This system just isn't working right. The other two aren't working quite correctly either. But this is a good example. If we can have another slide, please. Then quickly, I mentioned that the, that the cortical areas of the front of the brain especially feed down and control the lower parts of the brain, especially impulses that come up, so that we can say, I'd like to do that, but I'm not going to, because it's going to get me in trouble if I do it. That means that the cortical mantle has to be functioning reasonably well. And across the top here is the activity of serotonin, which is a way of inhibiting the lower brain serotonin in the cortical mantle of the cells. But this is the cortex here. This is one way of looking at the brain, another, and then a sagittal section. You can see there's a pretty good level of uh, serotonin activity, but not in borderline patients. That means that the top-down effect of thinking, the top-down effect of impulse control, just not working well. Next slide, please. Treatments, two categories of treatments. One, medications. What do medications do? They help correct some of the chemical imbalances that are a consequence of the neurological deficits we've already seen. They're very important. It takes a lot of skill on the physician's part to figure out when and where and so on. And that's one of the problems in getting the care to the patients because it takes so much experience and skill. It's so complicated. The same is true for the, the psychotherapies. And there are a number of different psychotherapies in addition to DBT. You'll hear a lot about DBT because it's a wonderful therapy. DBT is not a panacea. DBT is especially good for certain types of patients. Other types of therapies work well for people with borderline disorder as well. So, but it, for other types of patients, one of the struggles we have now is defining better pharmacological treatments and better psychosocial treatments. There are family related um, therapy groups that NEABPD, for example, and NAMI are sponsoring that are also very, very important. So there's a multiple number of treatments that have to be focused on not only the patient but on the uh, patient's family as well because the patient's family is so terribly involved as you've heard. Okay, let's quickly summarize then what we've, um, we've learned about this disorder. 
They're complex. They overlap with other psychiatric disorders. It makes them difficult to diagnose. Um, the uh, disorder has a biological basis, and its uh, symptoms are associated with specific dis uh, disturbances in specific brain pathways. We have useful treatments, but we're a long way from, going, from having really effective treatments, and we desperately need them. There's a tremendous lag of knowledge among mental health professionals and lay people about the disorder. <coughs> We've already heard that, not diagnosed early as it should be, not understood well. Th that means stigma goes up, levels of care, expert care um, go down, and the levels of funding are not quite, uh, not nearly what they need to be. The NIMH Bless the Hearts have funded um, a very important research uh, in this area. Um, but this is a relatively new disorder, um, and clearly BPD research is in its infancy compared to other major mental disorders. Thank you. Appreciate your attendance. And thank you. Thank you. Questions that I can answer, or more questions that you've had from um, for Tammy yeah. or from if if someone doctor if someone is a recovering alcoholic. Yes. And has a genetic predisposition to BPD. Could it be triggered by pain medication or anesthesia? And if so, how can that be known and how can it be dealt with? Um, for those of you who didn't hear the question, is if someone has um, alcoholism and borderline disorder and they're recovering from their, their alcoholism or drug disability, will receiving anesthesia, drugs, and so on trigger a relapse in the borderline symptoms, if I understand? And the answer is any stress that's excessive, if the patient is not well prepared for it, depending on their level of vulnerability, can trigger a borderline crisis. So it's very clear that something like that has to be, and surgery is a stress, um, even without the drugs. And you start messing around with the chemistry of the brain, which is already um, not where it needs to be, then that puts them closer uh, to the line of becoming symptomatic. So the answer is yes. Yes, sir. I have a question actually for I have a question for Tammy and for you, doctor. Um, I understand that in borderline personality disorder and sort of generically and uh, narcissistic personality specifically, that there is a factor of denial that people who suffer from this uh, disorder vehemently deny that there's anything wrong with them. Would you comment on that? Because I, in my life, I have somebody who has this, I believe, and um, I don't know how to tell her. I think that that's true. And it was true. It was hard for me to accept. And I think the reason it was hard for me to accept, I'm speaking from my personal experience, is because of the stigma, which is why I'm here. Because I, you know, I thought mental illness, I'm going to be walking the streets, a homeless person, which I thought might be happening to me because I was getting so ill. But, you know, there is a stigma, and I didn't realize that people could lead normal lives to it. And so I think helping people with borderline personality disorder accept their um, illness, part of it is um, helping the, the stigma of it not be so large in their brains, that people do get better, and some of the more hopeful aspects of it, and that there's a that there's finally an answer for them. Um, I also, I've talked to lots of different families in the same position that they just, they, they're, because we're very, very sensitive by nature and we overreact. So it's very difficult um, to speak to us about something that's so stressful, as the doctor just said. That stress of just learning about it can make the symptoms even worse. But building the trust and Speaking in very comforting, validating language is the most helpful thing. It, once we realize that we're understood, um, our symptoms actually can decrease. So just knowing that finally someone understands can make it a, an easier pill to swallow. Yeah. The only thing that, that I would add to Tammy's um, wonderful answer is that there are people who surprisingly come in and from the start are eager to hear what's wrong, uh, are appreciative to know this is what is wrong. Good Lord, it's been all these years, why has it, and are angry because 
a psychiatrist or someone else has not told them what is wrong. I've lost all these years and you know what's wrong. So there, it, it's not one type of person with the disorder. There are types, and then of course many people who have mixed feelings as most people do, who wants to get the bad news, but on the one hand there's some good news too. It's, it's kind of complicated. Okay, I have two questions. Um, the first one is just the, the people here today, and, the, and you mentioned your sister, um, and the person I know happens to be a woman. Is there a higher prevalence among females? Is, that, is there any kind of data the, about that? There is, it appears that there is a, approximately a three to one prevalence of, um, between males and females. Um, the, the epidemiological um, studies are really, the word is not finally in on this, but it looks that way right now. That means that if 2% is correct in terms of prevalence and three, the 3 to 1 ratio is correct, you do the math real fast, 1 in 33 women and 1 in 100 men. And my second question was just, um, do you think that greater education about the actual science of the disorder um, would be better in trying to eliminate that stigma? Because I think, I, I would think that parents would it would be easier for them to accept that their child had a neurological problem than a mental illness, like a personality disorder. So do you think that education about the science of it would be best? It helps me to accept mine. It, it feels like you're a bit of an alien trying to wage, wage your way through a world when you think differently. And so it's a great relief to know it's not because you're um, part of the frustration and part of the acting out of people with borderline is because they're so frustrated. They're so frustrated that they're expected to act a certain way. It's a tremendous relief to know, my gosh, there's something wrong with my brain. Just like if something was wrong with my kidney, if I had, you know, diabetes, it's, it's a tremendous relief to know. And to know that it can be treated. This certainly was the case. We have some other um, illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder 20 to 25 years ago. These kinds of data were beginning to become known about those disorders. The stigma there was just as great. The reluctance to diagnose was just as great. Once three things became, happened, the, the, the whole tide turned. One was this kind of, these kinds of data became apparent. Scientifically, we could talk about how